this is the history of medicine society meeting. We meet uh, once a month during the academic year and um, have a lecture. There are treats at the back and feel free to get something now, during, after, uh, just light snacks. There's also um, a sign-up sheet for the History of Medicine mailing list. And um, it's a pretty lightweight list. Um, I send out a monthly newsletter and announce the speakers. And very rarely somebody has a question that they would like to pose to the group. So um, feel free to sign up for the, for the list. Come in. So today, Marquise Berry is speaking on medical attitudes toward technology in the Hellenistic period. This, we don't often have talks about ancient Greece or the, the, the classical period, so this will be really interesting, I think. Uh, Marquis is an assistant professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Iowa. He arrived in Iowa City in 2011 and immediately expressed interest in the John Martin Rare Book Room and the History of Medicine Society. Um, he teaches courses on ancient medicine and courses in Latin and Greek literature at all levels. His research focuses primarily on the history of medicine and science in the Hellenistic and imperial periods. He is currently working on an article on the empiricist medical sect and a book project, Hellenistic Science at Court. Uh, Professor Berry holds a BA in Classics from St. Olaf and an MA and PhD in Classics from the University of Texas at Austin. So, welcome. Well, I want to thank uh, Donna Hurst and the History of Medicine Society for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, as far as I know, I am the only historian of medicine here on the University of Iowa campus. Uh, as Donna said, I am based in the Classics Department and I'm happy to teach classes in Latin and Greek, but I'm equally happy to interact with colleagues from across the university on both sides of the river. So, to my talk, then. What was technology in antiquity? The modern definition of the word technology is a 19th century coinage, emphasizing in particular the devices of the Industrial Revolution and their products, in a word, artifacts. The ancient equivalent of the modern term is best expressed in the ancient Greek word techne, which denotes not only products of knowledge, but the discipline that produces those products as well. The semantic field of this word is vast. Medicine was a techne, as was mathematics, but so were disciplines like rhetoric, sculpting, cooking, and carpentry. Techne was identified variously with other words, such as sophia, meaning wisdom or knowledge, episteme, rigorous stable knowledge, and dunamis, power, potentiality. Technology in antiquity was thus more widespread than our conception of machines and devices, and in this widespread conception was more integrated into intellectual and practical life. To an ancient physician, the title of my talk would be a non sequitur. Technology in the ancient sense encompasses both medicine and machine artifacts. <coughs> Yet I will be speaking about medical attitudes toward technology by three royal physicians who flourished during the Hellenistic era of Greco-Roman antiquity, canonically 323 to 31 BCE. This was a period when the Greeks colonized and ruled the kingdoms of the Eastern Mediterranean roughly here, and here, and this way, and here. And fashioned a pan-Mediterranean culture that mixed local social structures with a Greek-speaking colonial and aristocratic elite. All three physicians of my talk were royal physicians to the Ptolemies, 
the dynasty of Greek monarchs who ruled Egypt from the city of Alexandria. While my argument depends on the broader sense of ancient technology from above, after all, I'm going to be considering the interaction between two disciplines, medicine and mathematics, both considered techne in the ancient sense, I'm going to focus on medical attitudes towards machine artifacts in our contemporary sense of technology. And for the remainder of this talk, I will use the term technology in the modern sense. I will show how these three doctors employed machines in their medical practice, that is, how they applied machines to the body. First, Herophilus of Chalcedon, who used a water clock to measure pulse frequently. Second, Andreas of Charistus, who invented a machine to reduce joint dislocations. And third, Apollonius of Kidium, who denigrated newer intellectual therapies and returned to older machines for joint dislocation. My argument will be that these three royal physicians have an understanding of machines for social power and performance of medicine. Historians of science and historians of technology have not always lived happily together. The reasons are complex, but are partially due to an artificial antithesis between working against nature and working with nature, derived from Galileo. Recent studies in the history of technology in Greco-Roman antiquity have shown this to be a false and anachronistic dichotomy. Technology was not conceived in opposition to science, but in combination with it. The integration of technology into scientific investigation was strongest in the Hellenistic period. This was a period that saw the invention of screws, pistons, steam-driven toys, and numerous developments in the size and scope of weaponry. The strong integration of technology into scientific study and its conceptual similarity to the use of modern technology in science invites us to apply modern studies of technology to ancient material. One main argument of contemporary sociology of science is that machines are inscription devices. That is, they write and produce paper, and it is the writing on this paper that is important for the advancement of scientific concepts and theories. Sometimes therapy is derived from the inscriptions, as in an x-ray machine, and sometimes the charts and data produced by the machines are incorporated into a scientific paper. But there is a problem with using this kind of argument for ancient machines. Ancient machines, by contrast with modern machines, never produced paper trails. They do not inscribe their effects. Instead, I suggest that we think about ancient machines as a type of performance. I use the term performance to indicate a repeatable activity which provokes a reaction for the watching audience. And I'm intending a certain consistency to the activity and composition of the audience. In speaking of technology as performance, I don't mean to invoke the metaphor of actors upon a stage playing roles as if the people, props, and spoken lines are temporary identities of their real selves, which hide somewhere behind the curtain. No, the technology and its medical use are real. The doctor is accomplishing something real. Yet, as in all ancient medicine, the medical care given by machine often happened in public and created a spectacle for the crowd at which a doctor might undertake an epideictic display. Furthermore, the performance of technology establishes an emotive connection between the doctor and his audience, much in the manner of ancient rhetoric, also a technology in the ancient sense. And like the successful deployment of rhetoric, technology embellishes the doctor's reputation in front of an audience. The emotion aroused in the audience by watching machines was thalma, amazement. Sylvia Berryman and Karen Tyberg have extensively discussed this phenomenon in the case of the Alexandrian mechanician Hero. Serafina Kuamo has pointed to the juxtaposition, rather than opposition, of nature and techne in Hippocratic medical writings, the earliest medical writings that we possess from ancient Greece. The ancient Greek surgical text on fractures ascribed to Hippocrates has a largely positive attitude toward performance. Performance is expected of the physician. In fact, the text says that, quote, it is shameful and untechnical not to devise how to work devices. Now, since there was no institutionalized system of healthcare in antiquity, the medical marketplace provided patients with access to a range of healers, root cutters, village wise people, magicians, quacks of all stripes, and rationalist philosophical Hippocratic physicians. The ancient physician's ability to attract patients to himself and away from his competitors depended upon his reputation 
as a healer. In a large city, then, the individual physician faced greater competition from other healing traditions and other physicians as well. A large machine, or a small machine, and the medicine affected on it may have filled patients with amazement and allowed the physician to offer a unique service and thus distinguish himself from his competition. Technology can serve the physician as an aid to persuasion. Persuasion, it must be acknowledged, depends on a particular audience at a particular time. Which audience was persuaded by the physician's use of technology? The three physicians I will speak about today were all chief physicians to the Hellenistic monarchs and thus participants in the life at court. The court consisted of the monarch and his family, generals, ministers of state, jesters, courtesans, secretaries, poets, philosophers, and advisors of all sorts, a prospective audience far from the editorial board of the Journal of the American Medical Association. To persuade this audience that his medical ideas were correct, the court scientist had to offer this audience entertainment. The court audience appreciated science as entertainment. Novelty, surprise, and hybridity are aesthetic principles associated with the Ptolemaic courts. Now is not the place to deal extensively with the question of what Hellenistic court doctors did. I will simply summarize the results of previous scholarship. Court physicians accompanied monarchs in military campaigns. They acted as diplomats between monarchs and courts. They tutored princes. They took charge of the queen's bedchamber. They gave lectures on medicine, health, and the natural world. They were appointed as priests. They were appointed into hierarchical, the hierarchical ranks of the court and counted among the courts, the king's friends, bodyguards, first friends, and so on. These are examples of court titles given to different Hellenistic physicians. In short, they were intimate members of the court circle, placed within patronage networks, <coughs> assuming roles as both court functionary and physician. Not every court physician did all these things, but we should certainly imagine that the court and the doctor <coughs> believed that me, he might be called upon to do any of them. I turn now to the first royal physician, Herophilus of Chalcedon. I call Herophilus a royal physician in spite of the fact that we do not know whether he had a formal position at court. Nonetheless, he was intimately involved with the court and was sponsored by the first monarchs, Ptolemy I Soter and Ptolemy II of Philadelphus. You see their regnal dates here. I will be happy to talk about the <coughs> details of Herophilus' relationship with the Ptolemies, uh, but now I move on to Herophilus' use of technology. Herophilus attempted to measure the timing of pulse phenomena by means of a water clock. And I'm going to suggest here that Herophilus' application of the water clock to measure pulses is a Greek use of time, which I will call normativized time, on an Egyptian style of water clock. The ancient doctor Marcellinus recounts that Herophilus constructed a water clock to quantify the extent of a patient's fever. The clock contained measurements, likely lines drawn inside the bowl, for each age group. The timing device of the water clock is not the frequency of individual drops, a drip, 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 but rather their collective accumulation in the bowl or catching vessel underneath. When the vessel is filled, a set period of time has elapsed, and the doctor will subsequently compare the number of beats he has counted to the number he would expect in the patient's age group, the frequency of the pulse beat. The water clock and sundial were the only time measuring devices available in Greco-Roman antiquity, and the water clock was by far the more precise. All water clocks operate by allowing gravity to force falling water from one vessel to another. They differ in the amount of water they hold, the rate of the falling water, and whether the falling water is measured in the upper or the lower vessel. There are three kinds of water clocks, but only two were portable, and because we're told that Herophilus took his water clock with him, uh, thus relevant for Marcellinus's report about Herophilus. These two types are outflow clocks and inflow clocks. I summarize here some of my research about water clocks. The outflow water clock was known in both ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, but was used differently in each place. We can distinguish between how the clock functions and the use to which it is put. The portable Greek water clock, as in this example, 
This is the only extant uh, Greek example from before the Hellenistic period. The part that survived is this fracture right here, this part and this part, both of the handles are a modern reconstruction. It has a hole at the bottom to let the water out and a measuring hole at the top to make sure that the water is always set to the same level. This clock empties in about six minutes. It holds about six and a half liters worth of water and that's the register's mark on there uh, that the measure of weights in the court uh, has determined that this is a, a standardized clock. This Greek clock was used for what I will call normative time, that is, measuring an event by the duration of the clock's emptying. Greek water clocks, like this one, were used to limit the length of the speaker's time in court cases, such that different types of legal cases had different time lengths established for prosecution and defense. Thus, the duration of the clock establishes a norm of time against which the event is measured. Without markings on the inside of the bowl, and this one is clean, it is impossible to measure fractions or parts of time which elapse as the water flows out. This Egyptian clock, by contrast, this is the oldest Egyptian clock extant. It dates from about 1400 BCE. Uh, it was found in the Temple of Karnak, I believe. It's a dynastic Egyptian clock. This Egyptian clock, by contrast, is used for what I will call standardized time, that is, measuring segments of passing time. The Egyptian clock, marked on the inside, measures the hours of the passing night for each month. Here you see an illustration of the inside of this clock. As an astronomical device, the outside of the Egyptian clock is covered in hieroglyphs for the 12 months of the calendar. The inside here is covered by 12 series of vertical markings. You can see them here, 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 and so on. Set at varying heights, and you can see the marks right here, for instance. Set at varying heights, uh, <coughs> they mark the differing lengths of hours that have passed of the night for any given months. As the water flows out, an observer can mark the passing of an hour at different times of the year by inspecting the interior of the outflowing vessel. So, with this example of the Egyptian clock, the astronomer regulates his own position in the night. The water clock, regulating standardized time, measures itself against the visual position of the sun, moon, and stars around the Earth. The internal markings of the bowl allow the clock's users to measure standardized fractions of passing time. The second type of water clock is an inflow water clock, known only from dynastic Egypt. In the inflow clock, water, water or gravity forces water flowing from an upper container into the receiving chamber, and the timing device is the amount of water filling in to the receiving chamber. <coughs> Many small Egyptian inflow clocks survive, as in this example here. Some are only nine centimeters high. They are votive offerings intended to represent larger inflow clocks. These small ones are not marked inside their bowls, uh, and the bowl marked would be this column right here. Uh, on the right here, you see a Ptolemaic king, in fact, perhaps one of the later kings we'll talk about, dressed as an Egyptian pharaoh, offering to the goddess a votive inflow water clock in his outstretched left hand. And we have some other examples of inflow water clocks. Due to the interior markings of the receiving chamber, which they all have, the Egyptian inflow clocks, like Egyptian outflow clocks, measure standardized time. Now, Herophilus's water clock is a normative use of time, as in the Greek style of clock. This is the quote from Marcellinus, where we learn about Herophilus's water clock. Marcellinus recounts that Herophilus constructed a water clock to quantify the extent of a patient's fever for each age group. The measurement bowl of Herophilus's water clock thus provides a segment of standardized time during which a normative number of pulse beats is expected. Thus, Herophilus's use of the water clock is a normative use of the clock, measuring the pulse against a standardized period of time of the clock. Herophilus's water clock is also an inflow water clock, as in the Egyptian style. First, the noun filling up here. Uh, 
for the filling out of the water clock. Filling out, right there. Uh, the noun filling up confirms that Herophilus had used an inflow clock because the action of the water filling up the measuring vessel only takes place in the uh, inflow clock. Second, the phrase holding an expressed measurement, right here, implies that Herophilus had made a receiving bowl capable of measuring the amount of water that should flow in for a specified number of beats for each of the different ages. Finally, the verb in this passage, overshoot, indicates that the measurement bowl will have been marked inside with a level appropriate for each of the age group. Suppose, then, that a line inside the measuring bowl appropriate for the age group of adults corresponds to 50 beats. If the doctor feels 60 beats in the time period of the bowl's filling to the measurement line, the patient's pulse overshoots the norm for the age group. We thus imagine Herophilus entering the house of the patient, setting down an apparatus which allows water to flow into an inflow clock at a predictable rate, holding his patient's forearm to feel the pulse, and counting pulse beats as the water fills the bowl to the measuring lines appropriate for the patient's age group. Herophilus's attempt to quantify the pulse by water clock is a new concept, the application of a standardized measurement to normal pulse frequency. The water clock, as we have seen, was an old and traditional tool in both Greek and Egyptian culture, of which the inflow clock with interior markings seems to have been favored in Egypt, the outflow clock in Greece. Egyptian clocks were used for standardized time. The Greek clocks were used for normative time. I therefore suggest that we see Herophilus, the Greek colonist, using an Egyptian tool for a Greek conceptual end. Here is an example of hybridization in the fusing of Greek and Egyptian traditions, the mixing of Greek and Egyptian cultural elements. Yet Herophilus' water clock only captures one phenomenon, the frequency of pulse beat. This doesn't strike us as unusual because our contemporary Western biomedicine is most concerned with pulse rate, the equivalent of frequency. Herophilus, however, believed that the physician should be able to perceive five different characteristics of the pulse. Frequency, size, speed, vehemence, and rhythm. Why would Herophilus go to such a length to use a machine to only capture one phenomenon of the pulse? All the rest he could perceive by touch alone. I suggest that we should see court performance in Herophilus' water clock, the entertainment of science. Herophilus' water clock arouses amazement in court spectators by its visual and aural spectacle. The water clock itself is decorated with all sorts of Egyptian symbols. The water falls and plunks loudly into the receiving bowl. Both the physician and the patient must stand close enough to the falling water for the physician to see into the receiving bowl and watch the water level rise to the appropriate measurement mark. The patient, too, could look in the bowl and wait. The doctor holds the patient's forearm and counts pulse beats, in Greek numbers, of course. The doctor pronounces the patient sick or well, with a fever. Greek medical knowledge, thus, comes from an Egyptian cup, on a Greek patient, with Greek numbers, by the Egyptian waters which surrounded Alexandria. What could be a better medical embodiment of the colonialist Ptolemaic cultural project of imposing Greek practices on Egypt. The second physician I will discuss is Andreas of Charistus, uh, flourishing 250 to 217, who was probably a student of Herophilus. Andreas was the chief physician to Ptolemy IV Philopator, reigned 221 to 205. Andreas was intimately involved in the life at court. He was a client of the chief minister, he was accused of literary plagiarism by the head of the library. He engaged in literary polemics with a noted Alexandrian poet. And he was murdered during an assassination attempt on the king. Andreas was remembered in later antiquity chiefly for his pharmacological works and for a surgical machine he constructed. The machine's name is not preserved, and we do not have enough evidence at present to attempt a reconstruction of it. The evident purpose of the machine was to facilitate reductions of dislocated joints. The most detailed information about the machine is preserved in the book called Collection of Oribasius, a doctor of late antiquity, who is himself quoting Heliodorus, a doctor dating from the second century CE. This is a list of named parts of Andreas' machine, although not all, parts, all these parts are distinct, as I will show. 
In his fundamental study of Andreas's machine, Heinrich von Staden has shown that all these terms belong to the contemporary Hellenistic discourse of mechanics and are parts, in fact, of contemporary war machines. Let me go through the most important of these parts individually. Since it remains an open question whether the verbal description of the machine quoted in Heliodorus goes back to Andreas, I will concentrate less on the philology of the machine's parts and more on the machine's action. Once again, I will suggest that Andreas's machine evokes a spectacle. I start with ancones, or elbows. The elbows in Andreas's machine have two parts. First, a broad upper part called feathers. That is this one here. Second, a lower square part called heels, this one here. For this reason, some people, Heliodorus says, call the elbow as a whole a spade, this term. But this is a misuse of language, catachresis. Elismation calcone, or hammered plate. The hammered bronze plate is made from hammered bronze rather than poured bronze since this is stronger. The plate is nailed into a drilled hole in the so-called tortoise, which I will discuss in a moment. The nailed plate has on it teeth, these, like wheel cogs, which allow screws to be slotted into the teeth. Since there are at least two tortoises in Andreas's machine, there will be at least two bronze hammered plates. Cochleos, or screw. We are accustomed to think of screws primarily as fasteners, but screws are also used for translating rotational motion into linear motion, as in the machine of Andreas. There are two parts to a screw. The screw peg, which is the bolt along which the screw is threaded, and the thread of the screw. In our contemporary screws, the screw, thread, uh, <coughs> the screw thread is always constant. That is, the distance between one rotation of the screw thread and another always remains constant. However, according to Heliodorus's text, there are constantly threaded screws and screws whose screw threads do not advance at the same rate in different medical machines. Andreas's machine, at least, has our kinds of screws, which advance at the same rate of screw thread. Parascalia, or side legs. These are legs at the base of the frame, the frame there, cut sideways and reattached with hinges, uh, hinges and pins. The hinges allow the side legs to extend their full <coughs> length when the hinges are closed, and so transform the machine into an upright device on which the patient stands. Or, when the hinges are open, the side legs do not extend and thus transform the machine into a device on which the patient lays. Colonne, or tortoise. Finally, Andreas's machine has two parts called the tortoise. It is called a tortoise because it moves slowly so that it produces tension in a gentle way without causing lacerations or lesions to patients' bodies. There are two tortoises in Andreas's machine. One rises, another descends. Both are similar in their crossbars. Each tortoise has a different purpose. The upward tortoise causes the elbows to rise. The downward tortoise adds tension but noobs no parts. Perhaps the most important passage for understanding the tortoises and the overall action of Andreas's machine is the following text. <coughs> we could read this here. Let there be a construction made just as in the instrument of Andreas, the tortoises. Each tortoise is bored through, and through the hole the screw is threaded, and inside the hole an iron or hammered bronze plate is nailed to the tortoise. The hammered plate is called a tooth. This tooth of the tortoise is keyed into the screw thread of the screw. The rest follows, by twisting depending on the direction of the screw, that the hammered plate, so-called toothlet, held continuously in the screw thread furrow, moves the tortoise. Some parts of these very square screw threads are simple, some are double. The simple screw thread cut with one spiral moves two one tortoise. The double kind of screw is cut with two spirals and moves two tortoises. Such is the screw in the large frame of Andreas's instrument. For the wood piece between the crossbars is cut from its midpoint by opposite screw threads, so that, by a different directional turn of the screw, the tortoises either move from the midpoint to the crossbars or meet up from the crossbars at the middle. Here, all parts are integrated together. As the screw turns, the teeth of the plate catch. Since the plate is embedded in the tortoise, the tortoise follows the movement of the teeth around the furrows of the screw and moves. The rotational motion of the screw is translated into the rectilinear motion of the tortoise, 
One tortoise climbs and causes the elbows to rise while the other tortoise descends. Presumably, then, we must imagine that the patient's limbs are positioned over the tortoises in either a vertical or horizontal position, depending on whether the side legs are engaged. As the tortoises move, either apart or toward each other, different types of reductions are accomplished. In fact, Andreas's machine is capable of accomplishing the five classic types of reduction in ancient surgical treatments. Extension, stretching, traction, pressure, and reduction, generally. Andreas's machine is obviously a potentially performative use of technology. The machine evokes amazement in its audience by its novelty, surprise, and hybridity. The machine moves and is unexpectedly capable of transforming itself into different shapes. It is built using the novel contemporary technology of siege engines applied to the body for the doctor to wage war against the diseases of bones and joint dislocations. It combines traditional medical techniques of reduction with the artifact pieces of sophisticated weaponry. Andreas's machine is a piece of technology designed to appeal to patients who want novelty, refinement, and gentleness of treatment. The machine of Andreas would have been right at home at the court. Apollonius of Kidium, the final physician I will talk about, is much later than Herophilus and Andreas. Herophilus was the chief physician probably to the Ptolemaic monarch uh, Ptolemy XII Thaulates, the father of the famous Cleopatra. Apollonius flourishes between 90 and 70 BCE, about 100 and, um, 140, 150 years after the death of Andreas. Apollonius wrote a three-chapter treatise on Hippocrates' work on joints at the request of the king. Here's the introduction to his treatise. The Greek king asked his chief physician to explain how the mythologized founder of Greek medicine treated joint injuries commonly occurring in wrestling, a Greek fascination. This is Greek cultural tradition writ scientific. Now, an important component of Hippocrates on joints, the text, is Hippocrates' description and use of a mechanical bench for reducing dislocations. Yet Apollonius' text is notable for what it does not say. His commentary on Hippocrates' bench ignores the mechanical functioning, apologizes for disreputable physicians' interest in mechanical theatrics, and does not discuss the newer theoretical principles which led to the invention of the bench and never mentions newer Hellenistic medical machines for reducing dislocations. After all, Hippocrates was not the only ancient doctor to have invented a machine for reducing dislocations of the femur. As we have just seen, Andreas, among other Hellenistic physicians, invented different machines for reducing dislocations. It has been a long-standing mystery to scholarship why Apollonius does not mention Hellenistic improvements to the Hippocratic bench. How did the Hippocratic bench work? This is not an easy question to answer. The text is difficult, and there are manuscript variants which give different senses to the mechanical construction. In fact, Apollonius's manuscripts gives a different reading than the Hippocrates' manuscripts. No reconstruction of the bench done in the last 150 years has won complete support. I show these two modern reconstructions of the bench, this one here, and this one here, simply for informational purposes. You can see that they're similar in some aspects and yet different in others. Now here, this picture, is an illustration of the bench from the medieval manuscript of Apollonius. This picture, such as it is, is the only ancient illustration of the construction of a surgical machine that we possess. So, Rather than attempting a detailed analysis of the reconstruction and working of the bench, I want to emphasize its technical principles. The basic idea seems to be the mechanical principle of leverage. The surgeon or his assistants pin or stabilize the patient's body in such a way that mechanical force is applied to only a single joint. Force may be applied through a lever bar, where a hoist lifts the patient's leg, and the lever bar, pushed down at the far end, lifts and reinserts the hip joint. Force may also be applied through tension ropes so that the stabilized leg is pulled away from the hip dislocated hip joint in order to loosen the joint all the more so that it may be reinserted. 
In both cases, neither the bench nor the patient move. What is visually arresting is the patient laid horizontally on the board, pulled by ropes as if in a torture device, or the surgeon and his assistants exerting themselves on the seesaw lever bar. If we compare the Hippocratic bench to its Hellenistic successors, so actually this chronologically came before Andreas's machine, but I've talked about them in reverse order, we notice several developments. As we saw with Andreas, parts of Andreas's machine move. The stationary patient, placed either vertically or horizontally on a moving machine, must have presented an arresting piece of medical performance. What the doctor gains in performance is an illustration that his therapeutic techniques are working. The inside of the body is invisible. Others cannot see the therapy being affected. Yet the visible movement illustrates that some therapy is happening. On the Hippocratic bench, ropes stretched to the legs were tightened, but the patient probably did not move much. On Andreas' machine, by contrast, the visible movement of the machine under the patient illustrated that something therapeutic was happening. This, I think, is why Apollonius neglects to mention newer mechanical devices. The comparison of Hippocrates' bench with Andreas' machine from a mechanical technical standpoint would have shown Hippocrates at a disadvantage. The Hellenistic machines were more mechanically complicated. That is, mechanics, the techne, had progressed in knowledge since Hippocrates' day, and with its progression, uh, so had the possibilities of performance. Apollonius seems aware of the social benefits of the machine to the physician, but in fact, he is embarrassed by the machine. He calls it the instrumental solution. One modern commentator has called Apollonius the polemicist of mechanicians. Apollonius is aware of the difference between the instrumental solution of the reduction of the dislocation of the femur, this is the only point that Hippocrates uses a device, and other unassisted reductions of dislocated joints. The Hippocratic text has a long list of other techniques that the doctor may use to uh, reduce dislocated joints which do not require the full force of a machine. The text shows Apollonius embarrassed. All right? This is Apollonius here, and then he starts quoting Hippocrates. For one must look at the fact that he, Hippocrates, stands in such matters especially on the side of truth, and charges down against those doctors standing on the side of quackery and fractions, in which he says in the very passages on the curvature of the spine, and then he quotes Hippocrates here, this is the Hippocratic text, for succussions on a ladder never straightened any case, so far as I know. And the practitioners who use this method are chiefly those who want to make the crowd gape. For to such people it seems marvelous to see a man suspended or shaken or treated in such ways. And they always applaud these performances, never troubling themselves about the result of the operation, whether bad or good. As to the doctors who devote themselves to this kind of thing, those at least whom I have known are incompetent. Apollonius expounds on this quote for the next several pages. <coughs> So this text shows Apollonius embarrassed with the Hippocratic author in the performative spectacle-like possibilities of technology that contain no therapeutic benefit. If Apollonius was embarrassed by the spectacle and performative technology possibilities of Hippocrates' bench, he would have been that much more embarrassed by Andreas's bench. Apollonius' silences and distaste of innovative therapeutics is part of his medical philosophy called empiricism. In a different place, which you can read next year now, I just learned it was accepted today, I have argued that early empiricism was much more concerned with questions of therapy than questions of knowledge. We saw that Andreas's machine was more mechanically sophisticated than Hippocrates' bench. Yet, Andreas's machine is no therapeutic advance on Hippocrates' bench. Both machines perform exactly the same kind of reductions for joint dislocations. Spectators may perceive or imagine they perceive efficacious therapy on Andreas's machine and not on Hippocrates because of the action involved and the spectacle of it, but in fact, the same medical procedures are affected on both machines. 
comparing the two machines from the point of view of therapy, as he would have done as an empiricist, Apollonius may have no need to adopt the new machine of Andreas. It was, after all, no therapeutic improvement on older machines. Hippocrates' machine was less showy and less involved in performance. And here you see a slide, uh, an illustration of the Hippocratic bench in action. This is actually for uh, a dislocation of uh, spine vertebrae back here. I began with general remarks about the historical definition of technology and the relationship between knowledge and artifacts produced from that knowledge. I return to that theme as a conclusion with two final thoughts. First, the origin or emergence of artifacts in antiquity cannot be divorced from their cultural context. Herophilus's water clock and Andreas's machine would not have arisen had these physicians not lived in ancient colonial Egypt, surrounded by mechanicians at court who designed new technologies for war machines and poets who encouraged a certain kind of aesthetics. Modern sociologists have noted the way that modern machines are often mass produced and consequently project scientific theories beyond their sphere of origin, of production. But in antiquity, there was no mass production of uniform artifacts, especially of the sort of mechanical machines we have been considering. It is especially difficult to separate machines for entertainment from their performance context. Second, there is no single development or progress to technology. Andreas's machine is the most sophisticated, yet it provides no therapeutic advance on the older instrument of Hippocrates. Is medical technology really a question of knowledge in antiquity? That might depend on which physicians you asked. Certainly machines for court performance seem to have been less concerned with knowledge for its own sake than science as entertainment. Therefore, I conclude that these three royal physicians have an understanding of the social power and performance of machines. Thank you. <laughs>